everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Paul Gannett, and I am Product Marketing Manager for Environmental Monitoring Products here at Onset. Before I turn the presentation over to our presenter, Madeline Wedge, I'd like to give a brief introduction. First, for those of you who don't know us, here's a quick overview of Onset. We are the company that makes the Hobo data loggers. We've been making data loggers since 1981 here in Massachusetts and Cape Cod, where we design and build all our products. Our logging solutions are used all over the world for monitoring environmental conditions and building performance, and we have a global network of dealers to provide service wherever you may be. This webinar will last approximately one hour, including some time at the end for your questions. If you have questions, please type them into the questions section on your GoToWebinar control panel. Both Madeline and I will be available to address questions during the question and answer segment. If we don't get to every question during the webinar, we will follow up with you after the presentation. We are recording the webinar today, and you will receive a follow-up email within a few days with a link to the recording. This way you can review the webinar at your own convenience or share it with colleagues. We are always looking for ways to improve the Onset Education Program, so please give us your feedback at the end of the webinar. When the webinar closes, a short evaluation survey will pop up on your screen and we would appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts. At this point, I would like to welcome Madeline Wedge, our presenter. Madeline is going to share with us her methods and results from her research on the effects of urban land use on Tidal Creek salinity and the fish community. So without any further ado, here's Madeline. Thank you, Paul. Today I'm going to present some of the work that I did for my master's work at Auburn University under Dr. Chris Anderson, which was mostly looking at urban land use effects on fish and fish communities. But today I'm going to be talking about how that impacted tidal creek salinity as well as how that had an impact on the fish communities. First of all, I'd like to talk about the importance of tidal creeks with salt marshes. Having salt marshes within tidal creeks allows the creeks to experience reduced wave erosion. The salt marshes act as a sink for certain nutrients, as well as a source of nutrients and organic matter for nearby coastal habitats. But perhaps most importantly, these tidal creeks and the marshes within them offer valuable habitat for economically important fish and decapod crustaceans. There's been a number of studies that have looked at urban land use effects on freshwater streams. And Walsh et al. in 2005 uh, came up with a term that, to describe some of the common reoccurring characteristics seen in these urban streams. And they describe it as the urban stream syndrome. And this is characterized by a flashier hydrograph. Uh, this means that after a rain event, you see a rapid increase in the stream flow to its peak and then a rapid decline where a forested stream would exhibit a much more gradual increase in stream flow and a gradual decrease. Urban streams are also characterized by increased nutrients and altered channel morphology. The altered channel morphology can be a result of that flashier hydrograph, which is related to the amount of impervious surface cover within a watershed. And this can be seen by incised or severely eroded streams, as well as direct anthropogenic alterations to the stream, such as channelization, um, direct augmentation of the channel, dams, etc. All of this results in changes to the stream habitat, which is associated with reduced biotic richness and increased abundance of tolerant species. Studies that have looked at urban land use impacts on fish communities in 
freshwater streams have found similar trends. Altered species composition, decreased species richness, and an increase in species tolerant of these new conditions, and an increase in non-native species. However, studies looking at tidal creeks have really focused on a variety of urban impacts, but specific to tidal creeks and salt marshes is hardened shorelines. So how does hardened shorelines, such as bulkheads or riprap's, compare to a more natural shoreline like salt marshes? Those studies have found altered fish community structure, lower fish species richness at these hardened shorelines, and different benthic invertebrate prey communities. But there really hasn't been any studies that have looked at how maintaining salt marshes within an urban tidal creek is different or the same as salt marshes within a tidal creek within a forested area. And in particular, this research is lacking in the Gulf of Mexico as well. Any work that has been done is really focused on the Atlantic coast. And we don't really know if tidal creeks display some of these characteristics of the urban stream syndrome that have been described for freshwater streams and how, if they do display any of those characteristics, how that might impact the fish that live within the tidal creeks and the salt marshes. And this is important because the Gulf Coast is experiencing increased development. Here we have two land use maps for Baldwin County, Alabama. And on the left, in 92, if you look at the red spots, which represent urban land use, we don't see a whole lot, mostly agriculture and forested. But then in 2005, that area has rapidly been converted to urban, suburban land use. So my research objectives were to determine how urban land use alters the tidal creeks and their salt marshes, and in particular salinity, as well as determining if urban land use results in changes to the fish community through changes to the habitat. Here is a map of the sites that were considered for this study. Just for reference over here on the left is Mobile Bay. Over here is Perdido Bay and Perdido River, which is the border between Alabama and Florida. And down here you have Gulf Shores and Orange Beach, and Pensacola is over here to the right. And Originally, we were planning on focusing the study more in the Mobile Bay area. But as we were looking at these sites, we were having a hard time finding consistent land use around the tidal creeks, as well as consistent characteristics of the tidal creeks and the salt marshes. What we found was that a lot of these tidal creeks that had so, some sort of marsh still as within them often had the salt marshes turning over to more of a brackish marsh as seen by the plant community. Most of the salt marshes in this area of the Gulf Coast along Alabama and Florida are dominated by black needle rush or Juncus rumerianus. And what we were seeing over in the Mobile Bay tidal creeks was that Juncus was no longer the dominant plant species in the marshes in that you had an increase in sawgrass or Cladium jamaicanese, which is a freshwater to brackish water species. 
And since my project was more focused on the fish aspect of it, it wasn't going to be a good comparison to compare marshes that were showing more brackish characteristics to salt marsh. Because if the plants are changing, the fish are definitely going to be showing some differences. However, we were able to find six creeks that showed consistent characteristics for the two categories we wanted, urban and reference. And they were along Wolf Bay, Perdido Bay, and Pensacola Bay. We had three urban and three reference. The urban were characterized by having 50 houses or more within a 500 meter radius. And the reference had less than 10 houses within a 500 meter radius of the creek and the salt marshes. Again, it was important to us to have the marshes dominated by that black needle rush. So that was the dominant plant species in our marshes. And we chose four of those salt marshes. And in selecting those to be sampled for fish, we chose them to be representative not only of the marshes found within the creek, but also similar between the creeks. So here's a map of my study sites. The green circles are reference. Urban are red triangles. And again, the black squares are the ones that were considered. You can see that my site straddled that Alabama-Florida border of Perdido Bay. And while the spread is not as even as we would have liked, again, they show the most consistent characteristics for comparing urban land use to our reference. So here's a picture of a typical reference and urban creek, just to give you guys an idea of what I'm talking about with these characteristics. Here on the reference, you can see that it's mostly forested around my salt marshes that I sampled, which you can see in yellow. And then in the urban one, most of all of my creeks had this sort of residential development within 500 meters of the salt marshes and the tidal creek. So for habitat measures, I used the hobo conductivity data loggers in conjunction with the hobo waterproof shuttle to measure water temperature and salinity. The waterproof shuttle is used to set up the conductivity data loggers, as well as to download the data while you're in the field. And I set the conductivity loggers to record at five minute intervals, which meant a bi-monthly download so that I would continue to get data and not have the loggers fill up, which was also helpful to check on them and make sure everything was all right. And I had this deployed for one year, starting in March 2012. So just a little bit more about how I deployed these conductivity loggers. I was only able to do one logger per creek due to budget constraints. And I made a PVC case to store the logger in, which you can see in this upper left-hand corner. I know it's a little hard to see. We'll get a little closer view on the next slide where I talk more about the case. And I used a coated cable and attached it to a cinder block and typically a tree on the shoreline to secure the logger in place at a certain depth. So here's a better look at that case. And you can see that it gets pretty dirty out here in the tidal creeks, which is why we had the case, to help protect that logger and 
the data loggers actually stayed. It was all on the PVC case, which was good. So on top, you can see I had a little screw top. This is all for, I believe it was two inch PVC parts. And you can get this top part, which is this middle piece right here, that's actually threaded. So I was able to just screw off the top, throw in the data logger, and that was how I accessed it. So it was really easy. And then had a straight part of cut PVC pipe and a cap at the end. In the body of the PVC, I don't know how clearly you can see it since it's so dirty, but there are three holes drilled along the length and then around it are another set of three to four holes for about nine to twelve holes for the whole case to allow the water to move through pretty efficiently. Now because it is a conductivity logger, having metal near it can disrupt accurate ties up near where the logger's reading device was. That's why I used the coated cable as well. And these are actually U-bolts that I put on to make sure this logger didn't uh, slide around in its case with any sort of heavy rain event or hurricane that might come through. I didn't want it to slide up or down in shift position too much. And because I was concerned that the zip ties weren't going to hold it quite as tightly as I wanted, I also used a metal hose clamp here at the bottom, which should be well away from the recording area. And I didn't notice any differences when I was calibrating it. But if I were to do it again, I would actually use all zip ties because even though I was concerned at first that it would slide around, they didn't move at all. And my hose clamps actually ended up rusting and breaking being in the salt water for just one year. So better to use plastic than these metal parts. So when I put the logger in the field, again, I only had one per creek, so I had to try and space it so that it would be representative of all of my marshes. And I put them right in the middle, which you can see here as a red point. I was trying to choose a place on each of my creeks that was between my upper two marshes and my lower two marshes that also had a good, solid tree that I could anchor my logger to. So again, ran that cable around the tree and around the cinder block, used those U-bolts again to clamp them down, and I didn't end up losing any of my loggers or really see much movement, even though we had some pretty strong storms come through. I deployed them at low tide so that I could make sure that they weren't going to get above water uh, above water with the low tide. And at low tide, they were set about three to four feet deep. And in the Gulf of Mexico, though, we only experience micro tides, which means that the change is very small and often are, is overcome by any prevailing wind that may blow the water one way or the other. But typically, the range that you see for changes in tide are about a meter. If you were doing this on the Atlantic coast, you would definitely have to take your tides into consideration when deploying these. Now I did a number of other measures within the salt marshes themselves, but today I just want to talk to you guys about my vegetation surveys that I did. I did three along the marsh edge, which is where I sampled my fish. And then I did a transect perpendicular to the marsh edge, to the upland edge, at 10 evenly spaced plots using one meter squared. And I determined percent cover by species within those plots. 
To sample my fish, I use baited minnow traps set on the falling tide for four hours. And I set five traps along each marsh edge. And when I did this sampling, I also measured salinity and water temperature at each marsh using a handheld YSI. And this sampling was done seasonally, once in the winter, spring, summer, and fall. Back in the lab, all of my fish were measured for length and weight. And I normalized abundance and biomass per trap and calculated Shannon Wander index scores for each of my creeks. And if you're unfamiliar with the Shannon Weiner Index, it's a measure of diversity that takes into account not only the number of species, but also how many of each species you have in proportion to the others. So for instance, if you had one species that was the most abundant, and then smaller abundances of three other species, that site would not score as well as a site that had more even abundances of all six of those species. So moving on to my results, I'm going to talk about the habitat measures first and then relate those to my fish measures. So here are two representative creeks for the reference and the urban. This is taken straight from the HoboWare data program. I really like how they display the salinity and temperature over time. And you can see that in our reference creeks, salinity is the blue line. You do see changes with the tides and salinity and over time but they're much more gradual compared to the urban, which shows very rapid changes in salinity. But what's interesting is that the temperature trends are very similar, unlike the salinity. Now, if we look at these same two creeks with a heavy rain event that hit all of my creeks in June, you can see that the reference definitely is affected by all that rain. But bounces back up and really doesn't drop down to zero parts per thousand compared to the urban, which pretty much bottoms out at uh, zero parts per thousands or close to, and then pretty much stays fresh for a number of days before falling back up. And again, you can see that the temperature trends are fairly similar. Here's a probability plot for that reference creek that you just saw, Graham Creek. And I'm going to be going through these for each creek. And this is adjusted data. One of my loggers ended up malfunctioning. So it was out of commission for a couple months while it was getting fixed. And I had to cut the data from the rest of the creeks. And this is also averaged per hour that you're seeing. And what I want to draw your attention to is this tail end right here around the five parts per thousand. So even though in the, those last couple of slides we saw that it did get low, this reference creek did experience some fresh periods of fresh water and had an upper range of about 20 parts per thousand. And then if we look at Long Bayou, another reference, we see the same thing. We do experience these freshwater, very low salinity events. They're not very common. And again, sort of a similar tail upper end of this salinity. This last reference really doesn't go have many low salinity events at all, but again, same upper range. 
which tells me that we were pretty good about picking sites that had similar salinity ranges. Now if we switch over to an urban creek, weekly bayou, we notice that these low salinity events have much higher percent occurrence compared to the reference sites. But it still has about the same upper range. And we see this again in Grand Bayou. When I actually looked at the number of hours spent at these low salinities, urban creeks had about 150 hours that were spent below two parts per thousand, while the reference creeks only had about 30. So if you're a fish, that can be a pretty big deal. And here's our last one. Now this one didn't have as many low salinity events. Um, also had just a little bit lower uh, upper range. But on the whole, you can see that the urbans had, creeks had much more frequent low salinity events. Which is interesting because although we saw that with the hobo data, just looking at the plant community seen in these salt marshes, we didn't see quite that effect. Percent cover for juncus or that black needle rush was not significantly different between the urban and reference sites. And while we did see an increase in Cladium jamaicanese, sawgrass, in the urban sites, seen here in orange, it was not significantly so. So if I had only looked at the plant community as an indication of salinity, I would have missed what was going on. Now here are the resonant Sacrinodontiforms that I captured at my creeks. So my fish sampling was really focused on the small resonants that live in salt marshes. I chose the order Sacrinodontiforms because they are characterized by spending their whole life in the salt marshes when they live there. And these guys are often food, not only for a variety of predators, but the economically valuable fish such as redfish and speckled sea trout that happen to come in these tidal creeks are feeding on these guys. My dominant species was the gulf killifish, seen here in the middle. It has a preference for um, higher salinities compared to the rest of these, as does the long-nosed killifish. My second dominant species that I found was the sailfin molly, which is typically more abundant in brackish marshes, as is the marsh killifish, diamond killifish, and bayou killifish. So these are more abundant in lower salinities, while these are more abundant in higher salinities. Eastern mosquito fish is typically considered a freshwater species. It is tolerant of some salt water, but it uh, is definitely more abundant the more fresh you get. And then the rainwater killifish and the sheep sed minnow tend to be uh, equally abundant at a variety of salinities. So keeping that in mind, we're going to look at the overall species compositions that I found at my tidal creeks. And you'll notice some interesting things. My dominant species, gulf killifish, is much lower in abundance at the urban creeks, while it's higher at the reference creeks. Sailfin molly was more abundant at urban creeks, as was some of the other lower salinity species. And what's really interesting is when we look at the Shannon Weiner index scores. So if we look at Long Bayou, which has the highest abundance of all my creeks, it has the lowest Shannon Weiner index score. 
and that's because most of its abundance is taken up by that Gulf killifish, where if we look at the highest scoring Shannon Water Index Creek, the Urban Creek Weekly Bayou, you see that that abundance is more evenly distributed amongst the six species. So that's what the Shannon Water Index is describing, which is really interesting. So it seems that those low salinity events, all those hours at low salinities might be giving the species that are more tolerant of those lower salinities and prefer them a better edge on that dominant Gulf killifish and the abundance is more evenly distributed. The compositions also change seasonally. You can see here in the winter that abundance was down at all of the creeks and the Gulf killifish was lower in abundance while self and molly was higher. Get over to the spring and then the Gulf killifish increases in abundance at all creeks. Self and mollies drop very low in abundance at the reference creeks. Not so much in the urban. That trend sort of maintained through the summer. And then in the fall, I actually sampled right after a heavy rain event that hit all of my creeks. And I picked up a number of eastern mosquito fish, especially at my urban sites, which you can see in the top as blue. So moving on to just total fish abundance, that was significantly lower at urban creeks compared to reference, as was uh, mean fish biomass. So in summary, the urban tidal creeks exhibited more frequent low salinity periods than the reference creeks, as well as flashier hydrographs. And this is likely related to the changes in the fish community that we're seeing. We saw lower abundance of Gulf killifish at urban salt marshes and higher abundance of species that prefer lower salinities and lower fish abundance and biomass at those urban marshes, which could potentially impact the food sources or a number of predators. So in conclusion, the urban tidal creeks had an altered salinity regime, and the urban land use did impact the residential fish communities within the salt marshes. And this has the potential to decrease forage for the predators that are there. This project would not have been possible without funding from the McIntyre Stennis Cooperative Forestry Program. I'd like to thank Dr. Ash Bullard and Dr. Dennis DeVries for all their help and input on my project. Dr. Scott Fitz for allowing us to use the Weeks Bay Reserve facilities. Dr. Elise Irwin for use of her boat. I'd also like to thank all of the neighborhoods and private landowners that allowed us to use their boat ramps to access these marshes and tidal creeks, as well as all the help I had in the lab and in the field. And with that, I'll take any questions. OK. I'm going to uh, read some of these questions, and uh, we'll, uh, Madeline can address them. So uh, here's the, the, the first one. Your salinity data for the urban creeks show many more single point drops, which can be, from our experience, due to sediment or a bubble temporarily following the conductivity cell. Was the turbidity in the urban creeks higher than the reference creeks? I didn't measure turbidity directly, but just from being out in those creeks, 
I would have to say no. Um, they were equally turbid. But again, I didn't measure that, so that could have been something that affected them. But that was also something that we saw consistently at our urban creeks. I did just show representative ones, but it was consistent at all of the urban creeks versus the reference. Yep, thank you. Here's another question. Uh, I've looked at electrical conductivity using the same sensor you've used to measure salinity. What are the ions that you refer to as saline? Is that, uh, I don't know if you, if you did look at the, the actual makeup of that salinity because it, uh, it obviously different salt waters are, are different. And I guess that might require. Well, I honestly didn't look at the ions. I was really more interested in just seeing general trends in salinity and how that related to my fish. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to put out the um, conductivity loggers at the same time that I started sampling. If you noticed on my sampling si slide, I had started collecting fish before I had thrown out those uh, conductivity loggers. And one of the things that really pushed me to try and do a more passive data logger measurement of the salinity was that we were not seeing um, what potentially could be what we saw with the hobo data is using one point samples. Um, so that's why we pursued trying to get just a general salinity trend. Now, um, if you were more interested in looking specifically at salinity, that would be something to look at, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's uh, a common challenge. Uh, how well mixed was the water? Do you know whether there was stratification of fresh water that could have affected the measurements? I, I, hmm. It's always a challenge. I, I personally the, don't know how stratified it was. After um, I had mentioned in the fall that there was a heavy rain event, when I was measuring salinity at the marshes at, for that sampling, I did notice quite a sharp drop between some of my marshes, which I can only attribute to uh, the salt wedge that might have started to occur in the tidal creek. Part of the reason why I chose to place the logger so deep in the water, um, which was almost as far as I could put it, these are pretty shallow systems, uh, was because I wanted to have some sort of control for that salt wedge effect. Now, that could be something that I'm picking up on my data and will be worth looking into more. I know Chris is interested in really tackling this salinity and urban land use effects. Um, but I could not tell you specifically how uh, well stratified these creeks get. My guess is because they're small, they may not exhibit it as strongly, except for maybe during rain events when it would get pushed back. Um, but if you saw on my photo, most of these salt marshes weren't set too close to the mouth. And that was also um, sort of another control we wanted to minimize fluctuations between sites for uh, salinity and freshwater. Yeah, it sounds like a key was being consistent in, in how you, the depths and the, in how you position the, the sensors, so at least so that they're comparable, which makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that's always going to be an issue when you're dealing with uh, an environment like this where you've got fresh water and salt water mixing a lot and how that's all going to play into you being able to uh, measure what you want and be able to detect differences. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge. Yep. Here's a question that actually uh, might be a good one for me to address. 
is how is conductivity measured? Is it four wire or is it by induction? The effect of metal you mentioned suggests that it is induction. Uh, four wire measurements should not make a make that an issue. And uh, yes, the uh, the sensor technology that's used in the salinity logger is it's actually a capacitive technology. It, uh, the sensor doesn't actually make conduct uh, or contact with the water, and um, so it's it's basically an AC measurement circuit that's uh, that's measuring that. So any metal in the area could affect the measurement. Uh, usually we, we recommend having a, a one inch uh, sphere, uh, a radius sphere around the sensor that's free of metal so that it doesn't affect the measurement. So hopefully that answers that question. Let's see. Here's a question. Uh, were the sensors oriented horizontally or vertically in the water column? I guess if you remember back to the slide I had of deployment in the field, it was really on a diagonal. Um, I think onset, if you can correct me, Paul, typically mm -hmm. uh, suggests putting it vertically. Um, but unfortunately, with the shallow nature of these creeks, it was going to be pretty hard uh, to do that and be able to uh, secure it in a way I felt comfortable we'd be able to recover it and find it and um, get accurate readings and not have it end up above uh, water part of the time. Yeah. Yeah, there's just to add to that. You know, our suggestion is that the uh, the face of the sensor should be oriented vertically, uh, just so that it sheds air bubbles more easily. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the sensor or the whole logger being vertical. It just has to be that sensor face, uh, ideally. And which is in the you know obviously in the real world that and it's it's sometimes hard to control that. You know, sometimes you can force that by putting floats or anchors on one side or the other of the logger to help ensure the orientation, but it, it, it does get challenging. And, and certainly in, in calmer waters, that's less of an issue uh, with bubbles forming because you, you don't get the turbulence. Yeah. Here's another question. I didn't uh, hear it, but did you also measure DO? I think it could be a good measurement. Um, I don't think you did, though, right? I didn't. Unfortunately, uh, the I that I was uh, able to use did not measure DO. That is something that I wish I could have measured, because I know that that certainly has an impact on fish. But uh, unfortunately, I was not able to measure that. If I were to do uh, further work with this, that would definitely be something I would look at. Yeah, here's a question on, uh, did you make some sort of measurements with another meter to confirm uh, the effects of following on the conductivity measurements? So that's where the YSI was helpful, taking those. Now, again, it was just one-point measurements while I was sampling the fish, but I was able to compare those, and um, they seemed to line up pretty nicely. So I don't think, and like I said, that most of the fouling, at least in my system, was really more on the outside on the PVC. Stuff started to grow on that or most of the muck ended up on that rather than on the surface of the data logger. We did have like a little bit of mud at the bottom, but usually the conductivity loggers were pretty clean. It was the case and everything else that really got the brunt of being in that uh, salinity, high productivity environment. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you, you offloaded the data on a, 
uh, biweekly basis? Did you did you clean off the, the the conductivity sensor at each offload as well? Yes, it was actually bi-monthly, but yes, I would oh, yeah, try I, and yeah. clean up stuff as much as I could. But that being said, it, there wasn't really much to do with the loggers. I, I honestly had to do more to clean up the PVC case and the ends that you actually stick into the hobo shuttle, which is the opposite end. That was where yeah. most of the grime had settled. So I just had to clear that off so it would read properly and make sure my threads would still work on my case. Yeah, thanks. Okay, we've got time probably for a couple more questions. If you've got some more, send them in. Okay, well, it looks like uh, we may have answered most of your questions. Um, so at this point, maybe we'll kind of wrap things up. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, um, yeah as I mentioned earlier, we will send you a link to this recording. Uh, uh, afterwards, so you can uh, refer to that. Um, however, if you have questions at any time, please feel free to contact us at Onset, and uh, you can see our contact information here. Uh, please make special note of our website address, onsetcomp.com, as that is where you can find a wealth of information related to our data logging. This includes detailed information on our data loggers, of course, and software, and in the learning section, you can find an extensive library of recorded webinars, white papers, application notes, and many other valuable learning resources. So, at this point, I'd like to say thanks to all of you for attending our webinar today, and I would like to extend a special thank you to Madeline for sharing her expertise with us.